just wanna, I just wanna get effed up and dance. This is our only chance. Happiness is fleeting. This feeling's way too good to last. Get effed up and dance. No future and no. Welcome to Holly. I'm your host, Holly Solem. I write a Substack called Hollywood, W O U L D, because I would. And I write about my life in this crazy town, my experiences with dating, celebrities, sometimes dating celebrities, ghosts, the entertainment business, all kinds of weird shit. Um, And on this podcast, we talk to my friends and acquaintances about their Hollywood stories. And today we have my friend... Kare Kwong Calloway, aka Queen Kwong. She's a writer, a musician, an artist, a performer. She really does it all. Director, I don't know, I'm forgetting things. I'll have her tell you. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks. Are we Bye. ready? Here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm so blushing happy you're here. That intro you gave me. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I just didn't even do you justice. Thank you. No, I I I, I do a lot. I'm tired. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> I know. It must be exhausting being you. Um, do you remember how we met? Would you Ooh, like to start telling yes. this beautiful story <laughs> about about how you slept with my boyfriend? <laughs> okay. What happened? Um, so this was a long time ago. Uh, what year was it? Oof. 2005 2006 yeah I think so this was a long time ago this was a long time ago we've (laughs) we're past it um (laughs) clearly clearly and you're probably the best thing that came out of that relationship honestly oh okay so um, what happened so I was living with a musician slash producer this kind of infamous in the LA punk rock circuit, hipster circuit. Not a rock star. Not a rock star. No. Not this one. Um, no. <laughs> he um, was about, I don't know, 10 years older than me. I was a teenager still. I was probably like 18 or 19. Yeah. And he was an asshole. I think I was working three jobs and he would just sit in bed all day with his sunglasses on, <laughs> chain smoking. Oh my God popping Norcos like this is just what he did all the time that's and I would go work Uh um, three jobs and one day when I was leaving to go to work you arrived and he said that he had a co-write with you yeah um I later found out that you guys were not writing (laughs) (laughs) right well we were supposed to be yeah that was the intention yeah um but when we so Fast forward, I don't know, six months, and I broke up with him. He was very upset, and he did a series of things to get back at me. Oh, I don't know if I know this. Oh, yeah. He stole my shitty antenna TV, broke one of my guitars, ejaculated all over my clothes in the closet. (laughs) Yeah. That's so fucking gross. He, He was pretty gross. Um. But one of the things he texted me in, like, a text exchange fight when we broke up was, and I was fucking Holly Marilyn, and she makes your body look like a joke. Her body makes your body look like a joke. Okay. We pretty much have exactly the same body. Yes. <laughs> but it did, Now you that know, I'm looking at yeah, it yeah. right here, I'm like, I don't really see much of a difference. <laughs> like, about the same height. Yeah. Probably the same weight. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. Definitely similar enough, but... That was his go-to dig at me. Okay, so that is horrific, and I'm really sorry. I'm going to tell you publicly. <laughs> I'm really sorry, even though I've told you before. So I I remember that day, and I remember that session vaguely. But he and I had the same manager. Oh, yes. I remember that now. Yes. Yeah. And so my manager was like, oh, you should do a co-write with this person. And so I showed up at the house. Here's my version. <laughs> I showed up at the house and you were leaving and you were like and I was like hey nice to meet you and and then you left and I didn't know you were his girlfriend it was there wasn't like you guys didn't like kiss goodbye in front of me not that I saw and so 
maybe we sat down to like work on music like maybe I brought my guitar I don't remember but I do remember right away he gave me a Norco yeah <laughs> like within five minutes and then I don't really remember I just remember being very high and having <laughs> sex with him and being like oh well I guess we didn't write a song and my manager, our manager, being like, what'd you guys do today? And having to, like, make up some, oh, I don't, you know, we started something, but da, 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 like, one of those situations. Yeah. And then I just never thought about it again until <laughs> so many years later, I was with our mutual friend. I think I can say his name because- Roger? Roger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who is an actual rock star who is in The Cure- and Roger was like, oh, you know my friend Coray. She hates you. <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> why? What did I do? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, she hates you. You fucked her boyfriend. <laughs> and I was like, when? What boyfriend? And then he told me what happened. And then I was like sick to my stomach because I felt really bad because I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> an asshole. He's an asshole. Oh my God. And this just takes me into like men weaponizing women. Against each other. Against yeah. each other. It's such a fucking common thing. Yeah. And I'm so sick of it. And I'm so excited that we became friends for real. So then I don't quite remember what happened, but like you and I followed each other on Instagram for a long time. Yeah, and then I think at and one point... And then did point, Roger tell you that I really didn't know? And then you forgave me? Like, what happened? No, I forgave you. I mean... You were like, I'm over it. I'm I was here. way so over it, ago. yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't even really associate you with that, really, you know? But, um, Good. But I think we DM'd or we responded to each other's stories at some point. Yeah. Had some sort of DM Yeah, we were having, like, little DMs over yeah. the years. Yeah, and we just kind of connected on a few things and then finally got together and and our friends now I know and then we became best friends yeah so one of the great thank things, you the only good thing that came out of person that relationship who's yeah not a rock star no. not a rock thank star. you he's probably gonna watch this probably <laughs> like what do you mean I am a rock star yeah, I am a rock star <laughs> I still wear sunglasses and smoke yeah in bed <laughs> <laughs> okay so I'm really excited that you're here. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. You're a rock star. Uh, no. <laughs> In my no. eyes. That's all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> let, it be, let it be heard. <laughs> so how did you end up in L.A.? Like, you have kind of a crazy story about how you got here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, so when I was a teenager, I... I graduated high school pretty early, and I wanted to go to college in New York. I'm originally from Denver. Um, and the summer before I was supposed to go to college in New York, I did a road trip kind of across the country from Denver towards east, eastwards. <laughs> and I stopped in New Orleans with, um, it was a friend of mine, her name's Anna who I actually haven't talked to since then, so Shout it's pretty out crazy. Anna. Shout out to Anna. <laughs> um, we drove her little Kia, Kia Rio um, across the country, stopped in New Orleans, and I randomly happened to meet Trent Reznor, who um, is from Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain who he is, but just in case. <laughs> um, and I... He gave us a tour of his studio. Okay, in wait, 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 back up, back up. Okay, How did okay. you meet Trent Reznor? Um, on the street. So I, I'm trying to remember exactly how it happened. I think one of his, someone in his entourage um, was at a snow cone stand that we were at. It was August in <coughs> New Orleans. It was hot as fuck. So um, we were at a snow cone stand, and he said, oh, I work at this studio across the street do you want a tour and so like this guy didn't know you were a musician or no, anything no That's and so wild. we go into the studio and Trent's there and we get a tour of the studio and meet Trent and me being the very like cocky teenager I was I was like well I'm a musician too I play music too if you ever want to hear my song <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> and I wrote down my number or something and left. And he called me. Trent called me the next day and was like, oh, we want to hear your songs. I think they were really bored, to be honest. <laughs> um, and so I had this really shitty, like, pawn shop guitar. And I went and I... I think it was, I'm trying to remember correctly, Atticus Ross and Alan Mulder, a bunch of very, like, high-level, powerful producers and musicians were there because they were Did you know working. who these people were? Did you, were you, like, already a Nine Inch Nails fan or were I you a fan of this world? I was never a Nine world? Inch Nails fan. Ooh, I can't say healthy. I'm a Nine Inch Nails fan. No. <laughs> I mean, not even in a salty way. It was just a different genre. It wasn't something that you were, like, listening to, actually. No, um, yeah. never. It was just, I was more into punk rock and indie rock, and Nine Inch Nails was never, like goth music scene was um not me I think also I grew up in a actually a goth industrial nightclub that my dad owned and maybe because of that I rebelled and listened to punk music instead of goth or new wave so yeah. I don't know I mean I obviously knew who Trent Reznor was mm -hmm. um but I was also 17 it just wasn't my era really yeah. at that time so um but he was recording his like big comeback record or whatever there and I knew who Alan Mulder was because I was, he had worked with My Bloody Valentine, and that was more my speed. Mm -hmm. So I was more starstruck by him, probably. <laughs> um, but then they sat me down, and they all just sat there in the studio and gave me, you know, said, okay, just play a song. Did you just, like, play a song on your guitar? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. So you didn't even play them a recording. You just no, I performed. Like, yeah. Were you, so, were you nervous? Or did you go into, like, your flow state that I you definitely go into. didn't act like I was nervous but I do remember playing the song really fast and being like wow I think I did that like twice as fast as usual <laughs> so obviously something in me was pretty hyped up yeah but um and then from there Trent just said I if you want to record a demo you could record a demo here tonight with my people and my crew and we'll set you up in a studio and record a demo what was your friend Anna doing during this time <laughs> like <laughs> she was pretty weirded out I think or just like, <laughs> like what is happening yeah. I thought we were going on yeah. a road trip yeah I mean I think I probably there's many experiences Anna had with me that probably <laughs> scarred her for life <laughs> um but yeah I recorded that night and that was the beginning of instead of going to college in New York I moved here and lived and worked with Trent um, and then opened for Nine Inch Nails as a teenager and then again a few years later and then again a few years later yeah. um, and it's always been pretty strange because I don't play music like that like Nine Inch Nails it's a very odd pairing mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it doesn't make much sense. Right. But. So that's how you got out here. Was this yeah. ever, like, a plan in your mind ever to, like, move to Los Angeles I as hated a kid? LA. Always yeah. in L.A. <laughs> Actually, my same friend, Anna, we drove here during, like, a spring break um, one year. And we stayed at a youth hostel not too far from here called the Hollywood Gershwin. It's in Thai Town. And we were supposed to be here for a few days. After one night, I was like, this place is horrendous. Hollywood's horrendous. I never want to come back here again. You know, went back to Denver, decided I wanted to go to New York, go to the East Coast for school. And then six months later, I'm <laughs> living here and then have lived here now for the better part of, I don't know, 20 years? But you're Long leaving. time. I'm leaving. She's well, I'm all leaving. Yeah, I'm leaving. She's leaving us. She hates Hollywood. She's leaving. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> London calling. <laughs> yeah, moving to London. It's time. 20 years too late. I get it. It's okay. Not everyone needs to love Hollywood. I could see the good in it. Yeah. It's just not good enough. Not for me. Yeah. It's you know? just not for you. It's not for me. Never has been. And I think it's like, it's like a toxic relationship with a city, it feels like. Like, it's like Hollywood is... The guy who just gives you just enough to keep trying. Do you think that that's your relationship to Hollywood or is that your relationship to the music industry? It's synonymous for me. Like Hollywood is the music industry for me. You know? Yeah. That's just all I've it's all known you've here. done here. Yeah. So when you were like 
new here and you were working with Trent and <laughs> you were <laughs> making music and before you were dating this other guy you did work as I don't even have this in my notes but I just remembered and I want to talk about it you worked at the standard <laughs> <laughs> yes back in the day there were these uh there's a hotel called the standard it still exists right I don't know if the one here exists anymore. I don't know. It was a big thing then. It was a big thing. Mid-2000s. And there were these, like, glass giant aquariums that women (laughs) sit in in their underwear. (laughs) And Cray was one of those. I was, yeah. It was a big thing on my resume. Yeah. Highlight of my resume. (laughs) Yeah, it was one of those weird jobs that, I don't know. It is such a Hollywood thing. It too. It is such a Hollywood thing. Yeah. I just wore a little white panties and a little white wife beater and was in a glass box in this hotel lobby. That was my job is to just sit in this glass box. Was it like an eight hour shift? Yeah, it was seven or eight hours. Um, but you could do whatever you want. You just did it in the box. You're like living decor and people, you know, observed you. Would people take life pictures stuff. of you and stuff? Yeah, but this was still pre like iPhone. Right. Oh, that's right. That's right. I almost got that job. I can't remember why I didn't. Maybe it's because I worked at the Saddle Ranch instead (laughs) across the street. (laughs) You win. (laughs) I mean, I didn't last very long, but like people would like pay me to ride the bull. Yeah, see, that's a little bit too much effort. I think that <laughs> your the, job is better. Just so leg around the there. box is better. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't can, know why yeah. I didn't get that job. Maybe I didn't get it. Maybe like they didn't give it to me. I think I tried to get it. I feel like, yeah, I don't know. There was nothing on my resume at that point that would give me a leg up for that position. I did but... end up being um, Swan Princess at the Marc Jacobs store. So I that's was nice. in the window. It's more elevated. In- <laughs> I did wear couture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was way in more swan elevated. boat, and I was in the window just, like, laying in the swan boat all day. That's pretty nice. It was such a fucking great job. I swear, I would do that job today. It was the best. I was going to say, are they hiring? <laughs> it was, like, the best job I've ever had. People would come in, like, celebrities would come in and have their kids take pictures with me. And so was, you're, like, a mall Santa kind of. I'm a mall. I was a yeah. mall Santa. That was the only annoying part when I had to, like, sit up and smile. Yeah. But I also was always, like, hungover, and, like, I was, like, doing heroin at the time, so. (laughs) Mall Santa. Mall Santa. (laughs) Yeah, I probably reeked of booze just like a mall Santa. I love it. It was so classy. I love it. It was great. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about. So you kind of got in this whole world of, like, these rock stars, these, like, way older rock stars, going on tour with them, and you were more, like, a guy's girl. You were, like, one of the guys. Like, I wonder sort of what, how this happened where, like, I ended up being the person everyone was having sex with. And you ended up being, like, the cool guy's girl. Like, Well, it's funny because I think, I don't know if funny is the right word, but both of those positions, the one you were fulfilling and the one I was fulfilling, um, comes with probably the equally the same amount of shame in a way like Mm -hmm. at least during that time you know it's like okay you may have been the one sleeping with all of them and I was the one who was like talking shit about girls like you with all of them yeah but it was still kind of this delusional position where you feel like you're in a position of power but aren't you know and I and I think because I was so young there were things um I was shy. I was awkward in a lot of ways. I was not flirtatious. Um, So I didn't put myself out there. And you never got into drugs. No. I've done a lot of drugs. None of them stuck. (laughs) (laughs) I tried. I tried hard. It's impressive, though. I mean, I guess, yeah, some people just don't. It just never clicked with me. It's not like I wasn't trying. I tried. But it just never clicked with me. Um, I just kind of feel the same always. There was nothing. There was no drug that made me feel good enough where I was like, where it became a vice. I was like, this is okay, but, you know, (laughs) I'm hard to impress. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You're really hard to impress. But, yeah, I think I just fell into, because of just my character at the time, just being kind of an introvert and not 
very flirtatious, not much of a partier, I was scooped up and kind of given this, I, I mean, I wasn't part of the boys club, but I thought I was. You were like, yeah, like a kid sister or something. I mean, <laughs> fucked up shit happened, you know? There was yeah. fucked up shit so happened. So what are some things that would happen on tour that you would witness? And I, and this isn't about any, like, person that you toured with in particular, but just tours in general. Yeah, I mean, I think the point, the shame I mentioned is, like, I spent a lot of years in my younger years feeling like I was a feminist, you know, and really feeling like a really powerful, independent woman we're trying to be, and then I would go on the road and see horrible things happen to women and kind of have to, and feel pressure to kind of laugh it off with the dudes. Right. Because if I'm gonna be welcome in their club, I can't call them out on their shit. Yeah. But my personality by nature, like I call people out on their shit, you know? Right. So I was like priding myself in that way, but then on the other hand, I wasn't speaking up for women at all you know I was actually doing the opposite where I was like not only enabling it but kind of laughing it off yeah and it's a, a hard position to be in but also like at that age you yeah you're so young I mean even now today the industry is so male dominated like the only way in and the only way to like succeed is to sort of play play the game their game yeah it's what, true whichever path you take whether you're like the sex object or the or the you know, one of the guys, you're still yeah. having to like cater to all of these men and their egos. We were just talking on the way here about, uh, what did we say? Like the most dangerous men are the ones with like well, I, deep insecurities and too well, much power. Yeah. I think that that's the most dangerous combo is when you have men who are deeply insecure, but also hold positions of power. And that's your rock star. That's every rock star, star. <laughs> you know, um, really, honestly, I know a lot of rock stars and I would say nine out of 10. Yeah, that that's how it is. Um, yeah, the most of course, there are exceptions, people, of course. Disclaimer. Disclaimer. There are exceptions. There are some good rock stars yeah, out there. There are. Um, but <laughs> there's a level of insecurity that comes with, I think, fame, too. Like the more famous people I know, like the more insecure they are. But then they're in a position of power. And so it's it's a very toxic it's it's not good it's not a good combo yeah um there's very fragile egos but then they're power tripping all the time so it's hard because you know this industry as well as i do like you have to play the game to survive it to survive in it and you're trying to get ahead and make things work for yourself you feel a lot of pressure to stay quiet because you don't want to be the party pooper or you don't want to burn bridges and it's hard. It's a very fine balance. Um, and I, there's been times where I've spoken up and paid a price for it. Right. Many times. Many times. <laughs> Continuously still happening to this day, you know? Yeah. So you kind of have to choose your battles and it's hard being a woman in this industry with a conscience, you know, um, because of that, because you kind of have to put your integrity sometimes in the back seat. Well, yeah. I mean, you were just recently sued. I don't want to get you sued again. Yeah, I was so going to say. No, if you can <laughs> like, even talk about that. But yeah, I was recently <laughs> sued. Were, yeah. <laughs> we're sued for defamation. Mm -hmm. And and I won. You won. Because defamation is defended by the truth. If it's true, it's not defamation. Wow. So, um, but yeah, it was scary. And it was huge, hugely financially and emotionally um, draining, to say the least, you know. But yes, my ex-husband, who's... I guess a rock star, but D-list, very, very <laughs> down the list. And that is true. It's so truth, that's yeah. not defamation. That's not defamation. I think that's like, right? It's globally known. It's a globally known fact. <laughs> um, but yeah, he sued me for How defamation. How did you end up marrying him? Or can you say it? Really good here? question. <laughs> I mean, it's bizarre because we definitely weren't in the same music scene yeah. at all. How did you meet him? Um... I think he t tweeted at me. Ooh. I don't know. What's strange is that we, our mutual friend was Trent Reznor. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a little bit of trust there, or at least knowing like, okay, we kind of know the same people. Yeah. But we're definitely not in the safer. same scene. Yeah, slightly. But, you know, I, I don't really know how it happened, but it happened. It happened really fast. And um, 
I, yeah, it was crazy. It was a crazy, crazy, crazy experience. Um, and we've been divorced for a while now, but I did make a record called Couples Only. And it was... And it's an amazing record, and everybody needs to go out and listen to it immediately. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I definitely... Um, it was the hardest record I've ever made, but the most important probably thus far. And, of course, subject matter. There's a lot of subject matter in there, but some of it was about the end of this relationship and going through a divorce and starting over. Um but all in song and lyrics and, but, you know, press, it, press picked up on that. Mm -hmm. And then he sued me for defamation because, because of what press had said, what had press like record reviews that press had given me. Um, and I think his lawyers also cited lyrics. That's so terrifying. I mean, it's, it's really, really scary that you could just be financially drained in that way. Like you have to fight these battles. Yeah. Um, just, it could happen to any of us, any yeah. artist who well, it's also, speaks about their lives. And also just the power dynamic once again in this country, at least. Um, if you have more money, you can continue to just yeah, you can sue just people. Yeah, people yeah. And yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. I mean, I think technically speaking, he was saying that I wasn't allowed to say anything negative about him because that was a, an agreement in our divorce, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. Um, we agreed not to defame each other. But once again, truth is not defamation. Right. That's wild. And, yeah, you said so little. Um, I want to back up a little bit because before – Who else can I get sued by? Yeah. <laughs> Look at your list. Let's see. I've got a whole list of rock stars over here that we can uh, defame. <laughs> I mean, we could. We could, but, but we're not going. I don't to. have the money to Please fight don't multiple. Sue us. We're <laughs> yeah. poor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I also want to talk about how you ended up working at Crazy Girls because it's a really interesting story to me. <laughs> and I know you're cutting it out of something else you're working. <laughs> So, yeah, everything that you don't want to talk about. We're talking about. Else, we're going to talk about here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Crazy because Girls. Because also you're just, like, not that. I just would never think of this from you. As an exotic dancer? As an exotic dancer because you are the um, the guy's girl, you know? Yeah. So how did you decide to do that? I mean, I think initially it was a dare, and I and I was still young and didn't like being told I couldn't do something. You know, oh, I was like, yeah. I can do this. You know, um, but yeah, Crazy Girls is or was at the time pr a pretty notorious exotic dancer bikini bar, technically, I guess that yeah. you know was frequented by celebrities and it was, whatever. It was kind of the spot. It was like, the spot. I played shows there with my band. Oh yeah, they, that yeah. they did that too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I was in a very low spot in my life in general, <laughs> one of the many low points in my life, and I was broke, of course, and I had a friend, I was waiting tables, and I had a friend who would just come in every day with, like, her purse was just overflowing with cash, and she was a sex pot, so I was like, what is going, you know, she said, oh, I'm a dancer, you know, like, at night, I dance at crazy girls and I make a shit ton of money and I was like whoa can I dance at crazy girls and make a shit ton of money and she was like no <laughs> <laughs> was like, come on you know yeah um so then I showed up and, and I did you're like I'll show I'll you. show you but what was so <laughs> depressing I mean like honestly this is one of the lowest points of my life was I show up in these big shoes I think I watched like, my gay best friend and I rented movies that have, like, stripper scenes in it. Like, even strip tease or something. You just stuff to show me what strippers did because I had never so been in a like, strip club. Nothing. You were, like, determined. This girl said you couldn't do it. Yeah. And you were like, I will show her. So you yeah. studied. Yeah. I like watched the, the movies. Like, good student you are. Yes, exactly. The Asian <laughs> in me, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it well. Um, so I got the outfit of, at, like, Frederick's of Hollywood. and got the shoes and – you know, clomped around and watched, you know, Demi Moore do it or whatever. I said, oh, I can do this. Oh, God. So we get there, and the first thing they do is they just put you on stage. I said, okay, well, let, you know, let's see. Um, and <laughs> just by chance and my great luck, 
get up on stage and the DJ puts on a song. And you know how there's music, the music video is played on all the screens around the club. So you're just surrounded by the music video for the song. And it was a Nine Inch Nails song. <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> just rub salt into the wound. You know, it was just like insult to injury. So my God. Yeah. All the songs. Mm -hmm. And like, where all the was songs. your music career at that point? No, there was no music career. It was in the dumps. It was so bad. You know, I was just like, had given up on everything, you know, and it was a huge slap in the face. And I remember my friend came with me for the audition and he just gasps and he was prepared to just carry me off the stage and like rush me out. But I, I did it. It probably pushed you to dance even harder. I guess. Those just complete dissociation. I was just watching like, you. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh I'll show God. you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got the job. Um, I, I struggled to learn how to give a lap dance. That was awkward because I, in the movies, you don't like really touch all that much. Like I thought a lap dance was just kind of dancing around yeah. the person, not like grinding on the person. I learned that the hard way. You had way. to learn how to grind on people? Yeah. A very hot Russian girl had to school me on that. So. And you just were doing this all stone cold sober. Yeah. I was like drinking cherry cokes at the bar. Oh my god. It's a very weird like experiment How, I guess. That's like, yeah. What am I capable of? I mean of? I get it. I do all kinds of weird experiments on yeah. myself. Yeah. Like and the money was really good honestly. It yeah. was really really good and there's something empowering about it. It's one of those things that you know it works both ways. Yeah. It could work both ways you know. Totally. Um, so what are some like crazy things that happened at Crazy Girls? Well, I made good friends with Dave Navarro, who's a rock star, who's a good one in my book. Um, <laughs> I've heard he's a good one. Yeah, he is. A few people. I mean, at least the experience I had with him, he was very kind and funny and real. Um, but we became really good friends. He would bring me grilled cheese. Shout out Dave Navarro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was really nice. Um, and I think he managed me for a second. I don't know. What, I don't know. But he was great. Um, there were other people who came in who I probably shouldn't name, but <laughs> not so great. Oh, damn. <laughs> I think, um, so it was awkward in those ways. It was awkward when an ex of mine and his new girlfriend came in. No. Yeah, that wasn't great. Not a great experience. No. Yeah. That's not a great experience. Not a great experience. But it was also just, um, I think it made me a less judgmental person. Mm-hmm. Um, less judgmental of others and myself, other women and myself. It's just kind of one of those things where, you know, everyone's just doing what they have to do to survive. It's just that simple. Yeah, you know? LA is so weird about like jobs and working mm -hmm. and people. I I mean, I really thought I can't have a job. Like it'll be so embarrassing. Yeah. it'll be proof that I've failed, failed. Yeah. and if anyone ever sees me like working some regular job I'll just die and it's so weird that this is the only town in the world we're having a job we're having that a you're job. ashamed of it's like I know being a loser I know <gasps> what is that it's so hard it's one of the reasons why I really struggle to live here honestly because I definitely always need a job no matter what yeah. artistic endeavor I'm always in need of a job and working at crazy girls dancing was very well paid job yeah you know um, and when you do have some money in your pocket you are more powerful you yeah, feel better definitely so but it was hard because the people there were people who came in and definitely laughed at me and Ugh. yeah it was rough you're out there yeah watching this and also a lot of women gave me a lot of shit for it I mean I know times have changed a little in the right direction but I felt a lot of shaming from women I mean I believe that sadly yeah, I think, I think it's hard. I think I think we're so we we have like such internalized misogyny mm -hmm. that it's yeah just starting to change, or maybe we're just starting to be more aware of it. This is the year that I became friends with all of my exes' girlfriends, ex girlfriends. <laughs> it's like the I other swear, women. You this, became friends with the other. I women. became yeah. friends with all the other women this year, and it's like oh, we're all like we're friends. We're helping each other. We were all arch enemies like even meeting you I'm, I heard yeah. that girl hates you and I'm like <laughs> I mean that's a patriarchy this though, is at what work. we're supposed to do we're supposed to hate each other yeah exactly it only serves a patriarchy to like pit each other pit be pitted against each other and in the music industry especially I mean I can only speak 
to the rock genre because that's the one I'm in. But for so long, there could only be one token girl. Right. You know, um, and so every other girl is a threat. Yeah. Because there's only limited space for a girl in a rock band or a girl fronting a rock band. So um, I definitely wasn't a girl's girl for a long time because of that. Yeah. And now I think going through my divorce, I really realized the value of friendships with women. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, definitely. A huge deal. It's yeah. so meaningful to me. So. Wow, that's. It's kind of part of growing up, though, I think. is. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought of myself as a girl's girl, but I haven't certainly haven't behaved yeah. that way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's There's the disconnect. Yeah. And I do think that's very Hollywood or entertainment industry related. It's true. Yeah, because as women in any position, there can only be one. There's mm -hmm. only room for one. Um, as far as, like, the music industry goes... Yeah, what what is your experience been like? Like times you've given up, what does that look like? Every and day. like, how have you come back? And you know, where are you now? I mean, I know, but I think it's yeah. interesting to talk about because and I've people, given up completely. Yeah, yeah. I've turned my back a hundred percent on the music industry. I never thought I would do that. It's not a popular topic. That you know, I've done a lot of press for my records and I did a lot of press last year and I was more open about my reluctance to being part of the music industry still and I was open about how I actually don't love music you know I it's what I do it's who I am but it's almost like a toxic relationship yeah. for me um because I mean it's complicated like I, it's not that I don't love music. I love music. Music itself. Music itself. But yeah. being part of this industry is really horrible, I find. Right. Um, it's been really unhealthy for me. It's given me, there's a lot of insecurity wrapped up in it, a lot of ego wrapped up in it. I don't know why I do certain things, like even touring. I used to tour relentlessly. And I now wonder why, like what I'm actually getting out of this. Is it just an ego thing? And I know it's more than that, but it's very convoluted. Everything's very um, it's a complex thing, you know, especially when you do it for so long. That's your identity. How did you start playing music in the first place? Like, what was the seed in the very beginning baby career? It was because I was a writer. I always wanted to be a writer. And I think I struggled to articulate verbally and in the written form. But when you put music to it, you could be a little more vague and nuanced yeah and music helps um set the mood set the tone it's emotional so it was my way of it's like a cathartic thing where I could be emotional through sound and express myself through sound without having to articulate everything verbally but I had felt very connected to my lyrics and then pairing the sound with it and being able to use sound as my voice too was the only cathartic thing I had actually the only outlet I had growing up how old were you when you started playing? I was in the sixth grade when I started a band with my classmates called Population Three. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where'd I, you get that name? There were three of us, and I was very clever, clearly. That's what my first band was called. <laughs> what? Dynamite Lover. I love that. How old are you? You're like five. <laughs> no, but it's so like, I didn't understand like the double entendre. Yeah. Like, I thought I just was like, yeah, I like to blow shit up. Yeah. Yeah. Dad like, was like, like, no, I like that and I'm like, like that's not age appropriate. <laughs> of course. Mine was like sexual. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It was, um, I got into it young, but then I was also surrounded by music just being in a nightclub all the time. Yeah, what was your... I actually don't know about your dad's goth nightclub. It's weird. It's a weird situation. It's like Denver out of all places. But he had the most successful, like, famous industrial goth nightclub that opened the same year I was born and was open for 20 years, actually. And every birthday party I had was there. Oh, my God. Tim Curry was always there for some reason. Divine was oh there. Oh, my God. That is so weird. Like, Somebody skinny puppy would play there. DM'd me. Like two days ago, and was like, "You're the female Tim Curry." What? <laughs> Wait, did they give an explanation? No. I'm failing to connect. I was like, why? Don't know about this. <laughs> I don't know how you should I feel about that. Heard yeah. that name. 
That's really so now hot. I'm trying to like pick what's going on. I don't know. Okay, so Tim Curry was <laughs> yeah, just a lot party. Of, yeah, just a lot of like <laughs> random weird people like that. It was like kind of the hangout place. It was like the Studio 54 of Denver, which is very strange. Weird. Yeah. Did, like Trent and those guys know about your dad's club? Probably not. I don't know. I mean, I, I know the Smashing Pumpkins went through there, Skinny Puppy, but I don't know. Um, oh. Yeah, so I just grew up there in that scene at a very, very, like, from birth up until, I mean, I was bartending there when I was 15. That was kind of my first job. So it was a big part of my upbringing to just be surrounded by music. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that definitely brings, like, the sort of one of the guys thing and just, like, being around all these band guys. Like, yeah. Obviously, I had that experience too yeah. with my dad the band guy <laughs> in a band yeah just like guys like band guys yeah. around and feeling very comfortable yeah exactly. in that world and like there's a certain way like musicians talk and hang out and relate to each other that is like home <laughs> yeah and I also think that when it becomes something that's comfortable and isn't like a star-studded thing I find that at least male celebrities really like it when you're not at first starstruck by them. It's like a game. Yeah. Because I have seemed to fall into this role of being like a rock star magnet. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, what am I doing that is making rock stars want to DM me and like hang out and be friends, you know? And it's like, oh, it's because I show zero interest. Yes. And you know, all the rock stars I've dated I've never listened to their bands I yeah. wasn't I didn't care yeah. I wasn't you didn't care to them yeah. I wasn't a fan they were just like another guy and then I would like see how big of a deal they were in the world and be like whoa wait what <laughs> that bites you in the ass though I find because at least I mean in my experience especially with my marriage it was oh, I really love this about you. I love that you're not some huge fangirl and that you're not kissing my ass all the time. That's more interesting and it's more of a challenge. But yeah. then I think they get tired of that. They're like, wait, how come you're not kissing my ass yes. yet? And then they're like, <laughs> like oh. I actually want you to kiss my ass and think I'm amazing. I need to go find someone who's going to feed my ego. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because you're not doing it. Yeah. You're not exactly. You're still not impressed. You're I not side stage you singing. Or, yeah, you're not <laughs> side stage singing all the lyrics, you know. Yeah. Also, like having your own thing, I think, is super intimidating. Threatening, to for sure. Most of these guys. Yeah, I wasn't cut out to be a rock star's wife. I've yeah. I figured that much out real fast. Yeah. Would you ever would you ever date a rock star again? No, never. I don't think I would either. Never. I'm actually so turned off by fame in general. I just think it's it's like we were talking about, you know, it's a lot of fragile egos with a lot of power. Mm-hmm. And that's just not a good combo. Yeah. In a relationship or in the world or anything, you know, it's that's not good. good. It's not good. Oh, um, I would I don't want to interrupt because it's no. so good. No, tell I us. I would just I'm curious to know like what <laughs> you're doing now and why maybe you're moving to London and then I would start to wrap it up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. You. We could just you have forever. Mic, right? So you we heard know. that. I still yeah. Hi. hi Mike. <laughs> That's Christiana, <laughs> our producer. Um, yeah, what is now? going I'm like, on? What now? Am I you are doing going now? on tour like tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I am. I won't just come like, out till I, I was gonna say let's the tour will be over the by tour then. will be done. <laughs> but yeah, in real time I'm going on tour in a couple days with the Dandy Warhols and the Black Angels. Um, and then I'm moving to London which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm doing a, some work with our friend Roger from The Cure. Shout out Roger. Yeah, love Roger. He's we love a good Roger. One. He's a good one. Um, and yeah, I most of my fan base has been in the UK and Europe anyway. So might as well go where I'm wanted. Are you going to make another record? Um, supposedly. <laughs> Every record I make, I'm like, this is the last one. I quit music. <laughs> and then somehow I get roped into making another. I know. So, you're so I don't good, know. though. I oh, want you to you. make another record. Thank you. I will you just for you. You are the craziest, best performer I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, going to cry. I'm so excited to come see you play on Friday. Thanks. Yeah. yeah we'll see. Um, How do you do that? <laughs> Before we go, what is that? What's the secret? Yeah, what's your secret? Like, you don't give a fuck on it's, stage. It's that. I think when I'm on stage is actually the only time I'm not performing Have at all. Have you always been this uninhibited? Yeah. I've just fucked up in so many ways in front of so many people my whole life that I just am not scared of it. 
I guess that's it. Also, I have this thing where I just click into a flow state and nothing's like really, I'm not really conscious of anything. Um, yeah. I don't think about it, but it is something I feel is like, it's weird because it's performance, but it's so natural to me. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, nothing's ever thought out, you know? Yeah. But, um, but there's a risk there. Like sometimes things are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't always go well sometimes it's a shit show but that's okay you know it's yeah. just I think well, that's what makes I mean, it exciting though sometimes it's, it's a shit show even if you're the most controlled performer on the planet yeah I mean performing is such a like anything live is it's a crap shoot yeah. every time exactly so I just embrace it I commit to that and then you're moving to London do you want to talk about any of the writing you're doing you want to keep it on the hush hush I think we could talk about it I'm writing a book Yes, Maybe. we're both we're both writing writing for books. Books. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and I'm excited. Yeah, we'll see. I'm so excited. I'm excited for you. All right. Well, I'm excited for you. Okay. okay. Best well, friends. I'm just best friends forever. I'm gonna come hang out in London and and we'll write our book. We'll write our books <laughs> together. It's so fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, let's talk about where everyone can find you. If you can just like say all your oh yeah it's socials and Queen Kwong, which is Queen Q U E E N and then Kwong K W O N G, and that's on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. I think those are the only ones. Oh, yeah, same everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I'll link everything in the show notes. Thanks. So it'll be easy to just click the link, get Queen Kwong's albums, all of them. The new one is so fucking good i listen thank to it all you. the time and um thank you so much for coming on Thanks, i really appreciate fun. it of course i love talking shit with you i know thank you so much for joining us on the hollywood podcast i am your host holly solem and you can find me on instagram at holly m solem same with like tiktok and twitter and all that shit i think and then my Substack is at hollywood H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-U-L-D. I'll see you next time. Just wanna, I just wanna get effed up and dance. This is our only chance. Happiness is fleeting.